Hi everyone, it's Ezekiel O'Callaghan here to talk about what happened for paleontology in the month of April, and it's finally the end of the semester of probably the strangest semester that we've ever had. So hopefully everyone's doing okay. And without any further ado, let's get started. The most talked about paper of this past month comes from Nizar Ibrahim et al, and talks about more material coming from Spinosaurus. This is the same author who presented the new Spinosaurus in 2014, which radically changed our idea of what the species may have acted like, with his new fossils in 2014 of Spinosaurus showing that it was much shorter legged and arguably even quadrupedal. The new fossils presented in this paper come from the tail of the animal, and it is probably the same individual as was discussed in 2014, as these fossils were found at the same site. The tail of the animal shows two unique adaptations, which help us to understand how it may have lived even better. The first is that it is extremely long, longer relative to its body than most other theropods. This helps to support the idea that it was not quadrupedal, and instead this long tail could have helped to act as a counterbalance, especially as how some people have suggested Spinosaurus may have actually walked slightly more upright than most other dinosaurs, in order to help this counterbalance work even better. But arguably the more interesting thing about the tail is the long neural spines coming off the top. The authors suggest that this would have supported a newt-like tail, with a small thinner fin up at the top of the long broader tail. Now, this isn't exactly like those of crocodilians, which is important to know as that is what we would most likely be looking for as a modern day analog. Instead, being more newt-like, the authors suggest that it may have been a pursuit predator, which there are some issues with that idea. In the water, pursuit predators are generally things like tuna, which are very fast and live in very open conditions where they can see a long distance. The reason I bring up the comparison to a tuna is because Spinosaurus is far different from a tuna. First off, the environment it lived in would have been much more murky as it was very much a large river delta system, meaning it would have been very muddy and hard for the animal to see, which is a big hindrance when trying to do pursuit predation over long distances. Additionally, Spinosaurus, as a large animal with a large sail, would have created a lot of drag, and that would have slowed the animal down. And I know some people have suggested that the sailfish has a large sail, and it's the fastest fish in the world. But when the sailfish is going up to its top speed, it lowers that sail, where Spinosaurus had to keep it up the entire time. What this means is Spinosaurus was probably using its tail to help swim through the large, powerful river currents of its environment more efficiently rather than more quickly. However, this tail can still suggest other hunting strategies it may have taken. For example, it may have taken a strategy somewhat like that of the slender-nosed crocodile of the modern day, which uses its body to help corral fish into the shallows. With this tail fin and the main sail on the animal, Spinosaurus would have been even more efficient at doing something like this, and it's something that could be looked into but would be hard to prove unless there was some sort of ichnofossil or trace fossil of the body impression of a Spinosaurus in the shallows, and even then it's going to be somewhat inconclusive. Talking about the environment though, we have a paper by many of the same authors that talks about the environment that Spinosaurus would have lived in. Coming from Morocco and called the Kem Kem Beds, the entire structure and geology of this area has never been specifically written about. What the authors do in this paper is take a serious look at this geology and separate out different formations and even groups, which are just a set of formations, in order to help describe what the environment would have been like throughout time. The most important formations for us are going to be the Dara Spa Formation and the Doira Formation, which together make up the larger Kem Kem group. The reason the authors chose the Kem Kem group is because the Kem Kem beds were already widely in use. However, Kem Kem beds doesn't have a formal scientific definition, rather it's just an informal name for the region that these rocks came from. By having a formal name, it helps scientists be able to identify exactly what fossils are coming from what area, and can help us understand exactly what was happening in the environment. The Garazba Formation is the older of these formations, and mostly consists of sandstones with some conglomerates, meaning that there are larger pieces of rock included in the river deposits of this formation. Eventually, this formation is replaced by the Doira Formation, which has more silty and mudstones, meaning that it would have been a much more slow-moving river, and helps us to understand how the different river environments evolved over time. Both of these formations do have fossils of Spinosaurus, and even Carcardonosaurus, However, only the Doira formation has preserved body fossils of either. 
meaning that the Dwarven Formation is where we should be looking if we are going to be trying to continue looking for fossils and large body fossils in the area. The authors also noted a few strange things about this group when looking at the paleontology as a whole. First, they noted that there are no mammals or birds coming from this group, which is strange as this formed during the early Cretaceous, when birds and mammals were getting spread around the world fairly well. The authors also noticed that there were a large number of theropods coming from the group. There's a fragmentary abelosaur, something like Rugops or Carcardonosaurus coming from the group, but also Carcardonosaurus, Spinosaurus, and Deltadromius, which all may have measured over 40 feet long, or about 11 meters. This is very unique, as having that much high density could mean a lot of different things for how they interacted with each other, particularly as there are very few herbivores coming from the formation such as Rabacosaurus or Oranosaurus. The authors suggest that with so many fish fossils coming from the formations, they may have acted as one of the main protein sources for many of the animals in the environment, particularly Spinosaurus. They also suggest that with this very complex river system flowing through North Africa, that many of these animals may have still lived in very distinctive environments, rather than being a single closely knit community, and that the river just piled all the fossils together for us to find later. As for new types of dinosaur, there is a new genus and species of Centrosaurine ceratopsian found, coming from the two medicine formation of Montana. Stellosaurus ancelae helps to show the evolutionary transition of animals like Cyracosaurus and their eventual progression into animals more like Pachyrhinosaurus. While still very partial, the animal shows greatly reduced parts of the frill from that of Cyracosaurus and a transition to a condition more like that of the later Ioneosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus. This can be seen in the two largest head spikes being reduced, and of the largest head spikes, there's being fewer of them. In the later centrosaurines, some of these head spikes would disappear entirely, and so it's very key for understanding how these different changes might have occurred. And if we can find more fossils of this animal, we might be able to look at some of the pathologies that occurred to see how these animals were essentially doing combat with one another, in order to compete for each other for resources. This fossil had been discovered many years ago, and there had been discussion on whether or not it wasn't a new species or genus. But this kind of study helps to show how important it is to go back and look at fossils, especially since there's not always time to go back and look at every single one until the right researcher comes along and takes a real interest in it. The Tanistrophiids are very strange animals, most notably animals like Tanistrophius, which had an exceedingly long neck that could easily make up 50% of the animal's overall body length. However, a new fossil has been uncovered which isn't a Tanistrophiid, but is very closely related to the earliest of them. Elisaurus gonwanoxidens was a very small terrestrial reptile coming from Brazil. The fact that it's terrestrial helps to indicate that the Tanistrophiids probably got their start on land as well. And this is very unique when you consider the best known Tanistrophiids, such as Tanistrophius, which was very likely at least semi-aquatic, and would have pushed itself along on the seafloor in order to hunt fish or squid in the shallow seas. What this shows is how quickly the different clades were able to fill in different niches in their environment, with the Tanistrophiids going from a land-based lifestyle to being at least semi-aquatic by the Middle Jurassic, only 7 million years after the end Permian extinction. This is very rapid diversification, and really helps us understand just how quickly different niches might fill in the face of modern day extinctions. Adalatherium hui is a very new species of Gondwanatherian mammal coming from the very, very end Cretaceous of Madagascar. The Gondwanatheres are a clade of mammals coming from the southern continents after the breakup of Pangaea. While we can't be certain that Adalatherium survived the KPG extinction, the Gondwanatheres as a whole definitely did. However, they certainly didn't survive to modern day, dying out in the late Eocene. What makes Adalatherium very interesting, though, is a very unique set of traits, the first of which is pretty easy to understand. It had a large number of foramen in its skull, and these would be connections for different blood vessels and nerves in order to connect to whiskers, meaning that its head would have been very, very sensitive. However, it also had a very strange set of teeth, and one of the back leg bones had a strange curve in it. We don't know exactly why either of these other two conditions existed, and hopefully further study will help shed some light on this, as this is a very well-preserved Gondwanathere, and a very unique one at that, and hopefully can help us to understand the broad diversity of life that existed during the late Cretaceous, 
Antarctica. It's cold, it's icy, and neither of these things really makes you jump out and think, frog. But there were frogs there as recently as 40 million years ago during the Eocene. During the Eocene, Antarctica was still very southern, but the world was also a much warmer place, and this is largely due to different tectonic activity that was occurring. Namely, Greenland pulling away from the rest of Europe, which created a large area of volcanism, but also the Indian subcontinent crashing into Asia, creating a series of volcanoes before the continent-to-continent -continent collision rose up the Himalayan mountains. The discovery of a frog in this Antarctic rock from this time period helps to show how much these greenhouse gases released by the tectonic activity changed the climate, and why we should be aware of modern-day greenhouse gases changing the climate across the globe. New fossil finds of amber coming from Australia and New Zealand can help us understand how that continent evolved over time, and how a lot of the changes that we saw in the Eocene with Antarctica were mirrored in the fossil record of these locations. The fossil record of this amber starts first in the Triassic, and by looking at pollen inside of that amber, researchers have been able to find a great bloom in life and plant life during what's been termed the Carnian Pluvial Episode, a time when the planet experienced a massive amount of rain right after the Permian-Triassic extinction. This allowed many of the plants to start recolonizing the land, and it is shown here that this was a very global event, rather than just happening in many of the more northern hemisphere Triassic deposits which are better studied. While there hasn't been any Jurassic amber found in Australia or New Zealand yet, there is Cretaceous amber coming from two different sites. What it shows is pretty indicative of the normal kind of environment that you would expect in the Cretaceous around the world, and that is going to be a more conifer-dominated forests with not an insignificant amount of angiosperms, as these flowering plants were starting to become more dominant during the Cretaceous. This trend of the angiosperms becoming more dominant can be seen as we move into the paleogene amber coming from this region, with much more of a dominant floral type of plant being present in the pollens that is found in this amber. Now, throughout these ambers, there are also a few arthropods that have been found, including one of the oldest ants coming from the southern hemisphere. Because these are so new, there's still a lot to be found and a lot more to be studied. But having this kind of consistent and very detailed record of what time periods and what exactly the climate was like, even as Antarctica was even more southern than it is today, can help us understand exactly what we might try and predict might exist in these ambers. A new study looked at some of the fossils coming from the Mason Creek Lagerstätten using Raman spectroscopy. What this is is essentially firing a single color monochromatic laser at the rock surface and analyzing how the different minerals, elements, and compounds in the rock interact with that single color. Through this, researchers have been able to find actually a quite bit of detail about how different animals in the Mason Creek area were preserved. Most notably, they found that the different arthropods and invertebrates were preserved with more polysaccharide type material, which would have come from the chitin of their exoskeletons. Meanwhile, the vertebrates show more of the products of proteins rather than things like the polysaccharides, and this would have been not necessarily the exact proteins the animal had, but the leavings of what it would have become after it broke down. What makes this very interesting though, is one of the most enigmatic animals of the time period is also found in Maison Creek. Tolly Monstrum is a genus of one of the most bizarre animals to ever swim on the planet. And what it shows with this new Raman spectroscopy is that it is very likely a vertebrate, showing these same kind of protein compounds preserved in the fossils of the animal. There's been a lot of debate over whether or not Tolly Monstrum was a vertebrate or an invertebrate, with a recent paper suggesting that it may have been an invertebrate. And this paper doesn't necessarily refute that paper directly, but provides an entirely different line of evidence for Tully Monstrum being a vertebrate. And that's nothing against the earlier authors who suggested it was an invertebrate. That's just the evidence that they had from their study. But with this though, we can now say with a bit more certainty that Tully Monstrum was probably a vertebrate. And if it was a vertebrate, it probably would have been related to something like the modern day hagfish. Although that's gonna be hard to tell for sure, until we find maybe different fossils coming from a different formation that show different details. The Mosasaurs are very late additions to the Mesozoic fauna, and this is despite the fact that they are very often depicted in paleo art. They were only around from about 92 million years ago until the end of the Cretaceous, 
a very, very small section of the time that dinosaurs walked the Earth and large marine reptiles dominated the oceans. Interestingly, though, this period about 92 million years ago coincides with the extinctions of many of the ichthyosaurs and many of the plesiosaur groups that were dominant for the earlier parts of the Mesozoic. This study analyzed exactly what kind of impacts the Mosasaurs may have had on some of those plesiosaur groups, and found that three plesiosaur groups were likely the most impacted. And those were the Elasmosaurines, which, because of their completely different body types and their hunting strategies, aren't as directly compared in this paper, and the Brachinocanine and Polycotylid plesiosaurs, which are two very distantly related types of short-necked plesiosaurs, which would have occupied the niche of the very large-bodied predators of the oceans, at least until the Mosasaurs showed up. Now, rather than direct hunting, it's more likely that the Mosasaurs became more dominant because of both their larger size and more generalized teeth. The teeth of the Tylosaurs specifically, which coincide with the vast majority of these extinctions, show a much more generalized diet being available to the Mosasaurs, meaning that in hard times, they wouldn't have to rely on as specialized a diet as the Brachinocanine and Polycotylid plesiosaurs. Not all of the largest sharks are closely related to Atodus megalodon, and during the Cretaceous there was one that actually had a feeding strategy completely unlike any of the other very large sharks that we know of, and these would have been the Tychodontid sharks. These sharks had very large, flat, crushing teeth, and likely fed on mollusks throughout the ocean, including ammonites, which would have been plentiful during the Cretaceous. But unlike modern mollusk-eating sharks, like the Port Jackson shark, which is very small, this animal could reach up to 30 feet in length, approaching the size of a basking shark today. A new study looking at two vertebrae that were preserved in Spain of one of these sharks helps us to understand just how exactly they grew to became as large as they were. What the study found is that Unlike more predatory sharks, such as the Great White, the Ptychodontid sharks would have grown much, much slower. And because of this, it's been inferred that they likely had case-selective breeding, which means you're going to have very few young that take a long time to grow up. Now that means there's more resources for those young, but in times of hardship, it's harder for those numbers to keep maintaining themselves, as the death of even just one individual can have a significant impact on the species. The authors suggest that this kind of case-selected breeding cycle was reasonably successful during the Cretaceous, when they first started becoming more dominant as large mollusk eaters. However, towards the end Cretaceous, as times got tougher, they did die out because of this exact reason. There weren't enough of them to keep the population sustainable. In fact, the growth of this kind of shark is actually in many ways comparable to the basking shark that I mentioned earlier in that they both have this very slow kind of growth with very few young relative to other sharks. In fact, the basking shark might be a very good analog to these tychodontid sharks, at least in some ways. While they do have different feeding strategies, with the basking shark being a filter feeder and tychodontid being a feeder on mollusks, it's very likely that they had very similar growth rates, and also a less intensive feeding style when compared to something like the great white, which has a very aggressive feeding style that takes a lot of energy. This kind of difference in feeding style may have been the reason the Tychodontids were selected evolutionarily to have fewer and slower growing young, as there wasn't as much competition to become large quickly. Hopefully this study can help us understand the different dynamics that case-selected species go through during extinction events, and can help us try and prepare for how different species may face the threat of extinction in the near future, as we continue to face more pollution, climate change, and deforestation across the world. Hi everyone, thanks for watching, you're all wonderful. It's hopefully you've all been okay. This this whole thing's a little wild. Paleontology's still happening. A lot of researchers are um, limited in the amount of research they can do because a lot of the stuff is in their labs, which are currently closed off. It's a very niche community and it's still feeling the effects of this. Hopefully everything works out well for people. And as always, be safe, take care, wash your hands, and don't go extinct.